previously in the complete creation. That dinosaur bearing layer called the Morrison Formation is so huge it covers 10 states and three Canadian provinces. Welcome back again. Thank you for joining me on this continuing saga. In the last show, we were discussing what the late Dr. Derek Ager called the persistence of facies. The downright shocking finds of rock layers covering huge areas like entire regions of continents, multiple countries, and routinely multiple continents. The Institute for Creation Research's Dr. Tim Clary and Davis Werner have conducted some excellent work on documenting these rock layers they call mega sequences. Emphasis on mega, as they showed that these layers can correlate right across multiple continents. They presented the data they had compiled thus far at the 8th annual ICC conference, or the 8th ICC conference, and I highly recommend that you read the paper. Now, unfortunately, an issue arose because they repeatedly contended that the geologic column existed, contrary to what many creationists, including myself, had argued over the years. Some clarity is needed here because many of the statements they wrote in the paper are flat out dead wrong and demonstrably so. However, I understand what they were trying to say and agree with the principle of what they were trying to convey. Confused yet? <laughs> this is why clarity is needed. What these two fine upstanding gentlemen presented was the evidence and data they had compiled for these geological mega sequences. They weren't trying to address the geologic column per se, even though they said the exact opposite in writing. But there's just no way they're going to take the time to explain their statements and arguments more clearly, because this contention has become an issue not of the facts, but of semantics and indoctrination foisted upon both Clary and Werner and everybody else. <laughs> the only way I can honestly see how to resolve this issue is by first calling a spade a spade and spending the time undoing all the indoctrination and semantics that have been forced upon us. When you hear the term geologic column or fossil sequence, what is the picture that comes to your mind? Ta-da! This is the picture that comes to mind. When one says that term geologic column, whether you like it or not, this is the picture invoked in everybody's mind. So herein lies the problem. This geologic column that I'm sure we've all seen depicted, clearly showing the evolution of life throughout the rock record and clearly showing older rocks to younger rocks, this geologic column, as depicted, can only be found at three different places on planet Earth. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Verify it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. This geologic column only exists in three different places on planet Earth. Textbooks, museum displays, and in the minds of people. It does not exist in physical form anywhere on planet Earth. And even if it did, this fossil order would be invalid anyway. We could not look to this fossil sequence and determine an evolutionary timeline. Let's take a look at why that is. The problem and stumbling block before us is because, as you yourself just demonstrated, all I did was ask what picture that comes to what picture comes to your mind when I say the term geologic column. 
This is the picture that comes to mind, isn't it? The fossil sequence, the order of the rocks, and the ages of the rocks and fossils are all one big picture. The three are married together into one. So let me divorce them, first strip them apart, because whether or not there is a sequence or order to the rock layers around the world, and whether or not there is a sequence or order to the fossils around the world, and the ages of those rock layers, those are all completely separate questions and topics. For example, let's try to discuss this fish right here. It is a very famous fish called the coelacanth. It's famous specifically because of the interpretations opposed upon it by evolutionism. It had four large bony fins, which were assumed to be the precursors to legs. Now, I'm going to use a term I admit is provocative. I'm trying to get you guys to think. <laughs> so I'm trying to provoke you when I use the term evolution myth. But look up the definition of the word myth. We will revisit this later as you'll see that my use of the terminology is actually correct. In the mythology of evolutionism, fish evolved legs and walked up onto land as part of the evolutionary progression into land animals. So the coelacanth's bony fins were presumed to be the precursor to legs within the myth of evolutionism. Now, I'm going to use the conventional geologic column as it has been presented to us in this way. I don't agree with these ages, but I need to use those ages in order to make the point which shows the bankruptcy of the evolution myth. According to mythological evolutionism, the coelacanth first appears in the fossil record in the Devonian. You see? See? I can't even refer to the rock types by name without the evolutionary presuppositions in which you and I have both been flat out indoctrinated. When I said that word Devonian, how many of you thought to yourself, oh yes, that's a period of time. <laughs> it has nothing to do with time. It never has had anything to do with time or ages. That was a concept foisted upon the rocks and the science of geology by the myth of evolutionism. Devonian was the name given to some rock layers found in the county of De Devon, England. When other rocks were found around the world that had similar constitution and fossils, the early geologists simply assumed it was the same layer outcropping somewhere else. So they named that kind of rock Devonian. It had absolutely nothing to do with age, a fossil sequence, a rock sequence, or evolution. As a matter of fact, the rock layers around the world were originally divided up into four different categories based upon the assumption that the biblical record of history was truth. The primary, or the first, because they were considered original created rocks secondary, or the second, because they were considered primary rocks that had been reworked and deposited during Noah's flood. Tertiary, or the third, because these were considered to be rocks and sediments that were formed and deposited after Noah's flood. And quaternary, originally called quaternary, or the fourth, because these were rocks and sediments that were observed being formed more recently. When I talk about Jurassic, what comes to your mind? I mean, besides the movies. <laughs> the Jurassic period, right? Again, the Jurassic rocks were given their name by Alexander von Humboldt in 1795. He named those rocks after the Jura Mountains of Switzerland and France, where he studied that type of rock and the fossils contained within them. Nothing to do with age, nothing to do with evolution. The Cretaceous rocks, were named after the chalks of France we discussed in the previous couple of shows. That same layer could be traced all the way over to Texas and the Midwestern United States, where it is called the Austin Chalks, named after the city of Austin, Texas. The name Cretaceous 
was simply coined after the Greek word for chalk, which is crates. <laughs> The Triassics are sedimentary layers, which I have personally excavated in, in Texas, and can be traced all over the world. They were so named because of the three different colors the rocks would exhibit. The Permian rocks were named after Perm, Russia, where they were first studied. The Silurian rocks first studied were in an area once occupied by the Silurius people group, and so the first name was adopted after that people group. The Ordovician rocks, in like fashion, were named after the Ordovices tribe in Wales, as well as the Cambrian rocks named after the ancient name for Wales, Cambria. None of this had anything to do with age, evolution, fossil sequences, or an order of the rocks. They were so named simply to act as a description of the rocks. Ages and the fictitious evolutionary sequence of fossil life within those rocks was forced upon them by evolutionism later on. Oh, come on, Ian. Everybody knows that the order of fossils are found in the rock record. Well, actually, no, they aren't. I've personally found Calamites fossils from the Carboniferous way up here, up in the upper Cretaceous sediments of Alberta. The Creation Evidence Museum has also found Carboniferous plants during their excavations in the Paluxy River. There has also been fishes like the coelacanth found up here, and even mammals, which in the typical depiction of the geologic column, weren't even supposed to arrive until way up here. Numerous completely modern birds have also been found among the dinosaurs in Cretaceous rocks. Whoa, wait a minute. I thought birds were supposed to have evolved from the dinosaurs. Yes, that is what the evolutionism myth would claim, but that's not my problem. As you'll see later on, I've personally documented birds way down here in the bottom of the Carboniferous sediments. And I wasn't the only one. So right off the bat, just from my personal experience and observations, this sequence is fictitious. And while yes, I've been tremendously privil privileged to have been able to both excavate and study fossils all over the place, <laughs> I would hardly call my knowledge of the fossil record extensive. Others who have far, far more knowledge than I have noted in print that this fossil sequence doesn't exist. Dr. David M. Raup, formerly professor of geology at the University of Chicago and curator at the Chicago Field Museum, was definitely of evolutionary persuasion, but he was an honest evolutionist and an honest researcher. Having spent his life studying geology and the fossil record, he had this to say about the alleged fossil sequence in a New Scientist article back in 1981. A large number of well-trained scientists outside of evolutionary biology and paleontology have unfortunately gotten the idea that the fossil record is far more Darwinian than it is. This probably comes from the oversimplification inevitable in secondary sources, low-level textbooks, semi-popular articles, and so on. Also, there is probably some wishful thinking involved. In the years after Darwin, his advocates had hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found, yet the optimism has died hard and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Dr. Raup then makes an ironic observation of the time, an error that I sadly think some creation researchers are still making. One of the ironies of the creation-evolution debate is that the creationists have accepted the mistaken notion that the fossil record shows a detailed and orderly progression, and they have gone to great lengths to accommodate this fact into their flood geology. So in other words, what he's saying is that this evolutionary fossil sequence does not exist. And even going so far as to criticize creationary scientists for accepting that it apparently does. But let's take it a step farther. Let's assume that this depiction is at least a somewhat accurate portrayal of an actual fossil sequence that we do find in the rocks. Let's go back 
to the coelacanth. It first appears in Devonian rocks assigned an evolutionary age of around 400 million years or so. It is routinely found throughout the stratigraphic record right up to the time of the dinosaurs when it vanishes from the fossil record. So according to the evolutionary ages, it disappears some 75 million years ago. It was thought extinct until 1938 when one was caught by a fisherman off the coast of Madagascar. This one was filmed in November 2019 and you can see video footage of it kindly shared by the divers on YouTube. And you need to understand, this was like walking into your backyard and finding a stegosaurus grazing on your grass. This was an unbelievably stunning find. So besides the fact that the bony lobed fins were being used as you know, fins and not as legs, the implications of discovering this living fossil are extensive. Coming back to the geologic column, this fish is completely absent from the last 75 million years of rock record. 75 million years, that's a really, really, really long time. We know it was on Earth. It was around when those rock layers were formed. It just wasn't preserved in the fossil record. So wait a minute, why can't we apply that same principle down here in the lower rocks where it is also absent? Just because we don't find it in the rocks does not mean it wasn't there when the rocks were formed. This completely upends the entire fossil sequence because one of the foundational assumptions is that if it was around during such and such a time period, we will find it in the rocks. We now no longer have a fossil sequence upon which to base the evolution of life because this principle literally applies to every organism. Just because we don't find fossil man down here in the lower rocks does not mean he was not there when those rocks were laid down. When we find an alleged half-ape, half-human ancestor fossil in the rocks, we cannot assume it's the precursor to humans because we cannot rule out the possibility that humans were not around simply based on whether or not we find human fossils with it. But the coelacanth is certainly not the only living fossil we find. In 1994, a strange pine tree was discovered in Australia. Named the Willemi pine, it too made huge waves in the scientific community because it was thought to be extinct since the Jurassic period, or about 200 million years ago. Suddenly it's found alive today. Related to the Araucaria, or sometimes called the monkey puzzle tree, they are found extensively in the fossil record. I'll mention some of those locations in just a minute. But I have here a fossil pine cone. It's from the Araucaria tree. You can even see the seeds still preserved inside the fossil. So how do we know it's a pine cone from an Araucaria? Because it looks like one. 200 million years of evolution has caused the Araucaria pine tree to evolve into the Araucaria pine tree. But it's found so extensively in the dinosaur fossil beds in particular, why is it not found in rock layers alleged to be younger? It's still around today. Obviously, it was around when all these rock layers were made. Why wasn't it preserved? I don't know. And frankly, I don't care because the point is that the absence of the fossil does not mean that the plant was absent when the rock layers were laid down because we know it was there. Therefore, we cannot draw the conclusion that because it's absent in these rock layers, that it had not yet appeared or had not yet evolved because it may very well have been there when all of these rock layers were laid down and it just wasn't preserved. You can apply this principle to any organism anywhere in this entire geologic column. 
So this, the alleged evolutionary sequence, first of all, does not exist in the rock record. Secondly, even if it did, you still cannot base your evolutionary model and sequence of events on the presence or absence of fossils within the rock record. This entire geologic column is fiction. Now it is true in general, there has been some sorting of organism types into you know, specific layers. Uh, for example, the lowest layers appear to be entirely marine. But for the majority of what you see in the fossil record, it is a mixing of different life forms, not a sorting. For example, the Joggins fossil cliffs are famous for their plant fossils and the amphibian and lizard fossils found in the stumps. But it's also got ferns, the Cordatales pine trees, and sea life such as clams, horseshoe crabs, sharks, rayfish, fossil fishes, including the coelacanth, there has also been found what are like giant sow bugs, the Arthropleura. Now, while I disagree on the evolutionism being taught in the Joggins Fossil Center, I still highly recommend you visit so you can see these fossils yourself. The Joggins Fossil Cliffs has also given up a fossil damsel fly. And yes, even a fossil scorpion. So you have life from all environments, freshwater and saltwater, dry land, sea life like sharks, rays, and fishes, flying creatures like the damselfly, desert creatures like the scorpion, and giant sow bugs as well as amphibians and lizards. It's a mishmash of environments. And this is what we do find. Who knows what we have yet to find? If you head on down to the Green River Formation in Wyoming, the incredible fossil beds there are most famous for their fossil fish. I have a slab here and the details preserved even in the soft tissues can be astonishing sometimes. Uh, here the fish has been compressed so incredibly thin that you can make out the bones. But the scales and fins have been preserved occasionally even the eyes are preserved, as can be seen in this Green River Slab on display in the Big Valley Creation Science Museum in Big Valley, Alberta. Now, while fish are the most famous fossil, the fossils preserved there come from all environments, such as fossilized palm fronds. And again, this beautiful specimen is on display at the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, and you can even see one of the famous fossil fish that's been exposed in the slab. But other fossil fish from both freshwater and saltwater environs are found in the same layer, like this alligator gar pike, or beautifully preserved fossil rays. Alligators and a fossil snake have also been found, as well as trees, a fossil damselfly, a fossil lemur, which is basically a monkey, as well as a couple of fossil animals alleged to be part of the horse evolution series. Now, while I will revisit this contention later on, what I will focus on here is, what, is where we will agree. These were land-walking mammals. But you will also find flying creatures in the same layer, birds and bats. It's a mishmash of environments. In the Morrison Formation I spoke of previously, you've got copious dinosaurs such as the Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, and the like, and my good friend, paleontologist Joe Taylor, uh, mentioned the Ankylosaur that the creationary researchers excavated. It was buried upside down, just like many or possibly all of the Ankylosaurus found to date. How odd. I wonder why they were quite consistently buried upside down. In that dinosaur layer are found even more clams and oysters, saltwater rays and sharks, and freshwater fishes like the garpike, 
you find these Ericaria pines, and I mentioned this previously, this crushed, petrified log was removed from the Colorado dig site and is on display at the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas, so you can go see it for yourself. Some portions of the bark and core were not petrified. Other parts were turned to coal and petrified wood. But within the dinosaur bearing layer, the evolutionary paleontologists have admitted finding fish, frogs, salamanders, crocodiles, turtles, pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, mammals, and yes, even birds, identical to modern species. Yet you are hard pressed to find any information on those fossil birds, and you certainly will not see them on display or acknowledged in any of the evolutionary museums. Why not? The massive dinosaur bone beds in Montana, Alberta, and Saskatchewan are all the same mishmash of fossil life from different environs. Sea life through to flying creatures and insects. This geological column is fiction. It is not neat and orderly like has been portrayed to us all. In fact, it's a mess. <laughs> the presence or absence of fossils cannot be used to determine a history because organisms we know for a fact were present at the time and were not preserved in fossil form. All of these ages were simply assigned by the demands of evolutionism, partly based on the fossil sequence, which doesn't even exist. This geologic column we have all been taught is fiction. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. When we do find dinosaurs, they're usually you know, ripped apart like we saw. When they are found articulated, they are most often found in this death pose with their heads pulled back as far as they can go. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support. <laughs>